um, just a few housekeeping um, points. We're just going to make sure that the microphones are off. Uh, and if you want, you can keep your video on um, just because we're going to get a bit of engagement um, just due to the nature of the presentation. We're going to be asking loads of questions. We're going to be looking for feedback. Um, so you will need to unmute yourself. We might be picking a couple of people out there just to answer a few questions for us and their experiences too. So, and if you do have any questions, uh, please use the hand up function and we'll try and stop uh, midway and answer your question because we don't want things to roll on and then we're, we've kind of forgot about the theme that we're talking about. So off you go, Kevin. Thanks. First of all, uh, yeah, thanks to Eugene and, and the rest of Ulster GA for the chance to come back. It's been, uh, I think we won't say three years since I've left, but it's nice to be back in familiar territory. Um, I see a lot of the names in the in the chat bar there, and uh, you know people that I've recognised and dealt with before. Um, as Owen said, I want to encourage conversation, uh, debate throughout this. So there'll be times whenever, um, I suppose I'd be asking for it, but at times if you, if there's something comes into your head, stick your hand up, use the ha raise hand thing. Myself and Owen will be keeping an eye on that. But um, as Owen said, we'd rather answer the question there and then rather than waiting to the end um, because sometimes the questions get lost or else we get to the point where people are just trying to get off the call so um, if you fire your hand up as and when you have a question and we'll try and deal with it then because it might actually trigger other people as well with a few questions um, so to move on I've noted down a couple of session outcomes here um, and to be honest these, these have been largely guided by you know a brief that Eugene sent me across um, and I've tried to stick quite closely to that um, so the first, the first one that we're going to hit on is how can it be used? So some, some ideas and discussion around potential um, projects that we can use PA for. Um, the title is video analysis. I, I use the terms interchangeably, video analysis, performance analysis. Um, so forgive me on that one. Um, how can it be used? So a wee bit more in terms of what the potential options are for using analysis, be it video, be it stats, whatever it is. Are there, are there options out there for use um, in the academy system? We're going to chat a wee bit about how it can inform decisions um, and again thinking specifically along along the lines of the academy um, you know the, the, one of the obvious go-to's is player selection um, and seeing how we can use that or if we can use performance analysis to try and complement what we already do there informing development so i will touch on that yeah, I will touch on that and it will look some of the stuff might throw a few new ideas out there um, new ways of using performance analysis um, and thinking very much from an academy point of view, not just as the academy for players, but also from a coaching perspective as well. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of you guys operating within the academies are very well established down coaching route, but I'm sure you have of you know further ambition to go further. So seeing can we use performance analysis down that route as well. Um, we'll do a wee bit about the practical challenges. I think I'm sure most people know. It, to be honest, it's the practical challenges that are probably the reason performance analysis isn't more widespread as it is. So a lot of these you'll be aware of, but we'll just throw them out, have a quick chat about them and see is there anything that we can do to, to sidestep some of the challenges. <clears throat> and then the last bit, which might be a bit of a debate at the end, is it time well spent or is it a luxury? Um, I expect my most difficult question and probably probably from Eugene at this stage. Um, but yeah, the, you know, it's not necessarily that they're mutually exclusive questions. Um, it might be both, but we'll, we'll have a debate at the end about that. So in terms of what can be used, um, now analysis, and one thing that I, I want to highlight at the start, analysis happens all the time. Um, coaches is what we do. Um, it basically is analysis. So coach observations, um, that is all analysis. You're watching games, you're watching training sessions. That's what you're doing. You're analyzing, you're seeing what's going on. Um, traditionally, a lot of this is what all decisions have been based on in the past. Um, it's obviously changing now, but uh, you know, in the past, a lot of it would have been based on mainly on observations. Um, can be supported or influenced by others' opinions, um, and you know that might be other coaches. It could be other external people. Um, we'll all know ourselves some of the opinions that end up getting thrown out, and a lot of them can be you know, second-hand opinions or preconceived ideas. Um, the things that I still hear at predominantly at a club level, but you still hear them at well. Uh, in academy groups as well, even at even at county level, you'll hear queries about why someone wasn't selected to play. I heard he was going well at training. That's an opinion. And as a coach, when you're hearing something like that, it will have an influence. You don't necessarily make any decisions based on that, but it will have an influence. It will be sitting there. 
Um, the other one that what you'll hear, I've heard, I've heard numerous times in um, academy settings is, oh, he'll be great. His his brother was a great player. He'll be a great player. All right. So there's things that got opinions like that that just tend to tend to float in there. So moving towards the numbers and the stats side of things, numbers and stats is something that's developed and is developing. We're still in our infancy on it, but to be honest. And, and the, there is a wide a wide group of performance analysts and performance analysts in GA, and um, we are very much of the opinion that we're actually fairly well progressed compared to other sports, including professional codes. Um, some of the stuff that is happening at at the top level and filtering down through is as good, if not better, than than some professional sports, than a lot of professional sports. Um, it, to be honest, it's been one of the things that's been prevalent to me since I've moved to the Sports Institute. It's just how how advanced GA stuff is compared to a lot of high performance sports that we're working with. Um, so we are in a good place on that front, but there's still an awful lot more that probably could be done on. Um, video, video, everybody will know it. You know, videos everywhere. Um, there's very few games nowadays that you can't get video of or you can't try and source a video of, um, and, and a lot of people are doing it. And it's it's the sort of it's probably the bread and butter of getting the numbers and stats because to try and do number stats live during a game is, is nigh on impossible to get stuff accurate and to get enough information from it. So, um, yeah, the, the video is probably the, the bread and butter. It's the number one thing that we need to be worried about and need to be getting getting sorted out. Um, of one final one in this, just about records. Um, I'm going to circle back around to this as we get through. Um, but records are a potential long-term application of performance analysis. Um, I, I, look, I remember when Tony and Roger and Eugene and all will probably remember this maybe five or six years ago where we started, to do, I think Tony started to do an analysis of how many players playing senior inter-county inter level had actually come through what was the, it wasn't actually the county academies, but it was the, the elite academy down in Jordanstown. So Eugene or Eugene asked for those numbers. Tony was trying to gather them up, but that that was to me that was very basic level of record keeping. So what numbers are we actually getting through? Um, I think at the moment, if you if you looked at senior inter county teams and you asked how many players in those come through an academy setup, it'd probably be a high percentage. But not even having that to hand um, is probably an example of where we can get better in our records. Counties may have them individually. Um, some counties probably do. Some counties probably don't. So. It's something that we could get a lot better at, um, and you flip that round to the other side. You know, if counties keep a record of everybody that's been in their academies, and if you can turn around and tell an under sixteen when they've got to that level, there's still only a five percent chance that you get the senior inter county level or whatever it is. So having those numbers will be, a, you know, a really effective use of records. But I am going to circle back around that later from from another perspective in terms of where records could get us and could lead us to. Um, so what can be used, and I, I don't have much on the slides here, um, feel free anyone to, to type into the chat bar or raise your hand if you have any any queries around any specific software, um, or if you've used any software, drop the name of it into the chat bar. Uh, I suppose the one key message that I'm going to be taking or trying to push out just through this one slide, um, all softwares have their advantages and all softwares have their disadvantages, and that's, there's no there's no sort of gold standard. This is definitely the one that you have to have. Um, a lot of it depends on the, the job that you want to get done. It'll depend on budget, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, all have their own advantages, um, and it's not something to get. It's not something to get too concerned about initially. Um, if we look at it probably from a, a bottom-up approach, in terms of the the free softwares or. or We'll say the low price, and by low price, I mean sort of in round probably a hundred pounds or less. Um, there's one package out there, Kenovia, which some of the guys even in the group that I have talked to in the past would have used. Um, it's a free download. Uh, I think it's Kenovia.org. You can download it from. Uh, really, really useful tool for for basic level analysis. You can pull out you can pull out a couple of clips. You know, if you if you know where in the video you want to get to, you can pull out a couple of clips. You can do it all fairly fairly quickly. Um, you can add a few graphics. You can add a couple of you know a couple of things of text and stuff like that over the top of it. So it's really useful. Pull a video together. 
six or seven clips and if you want to save them gather them all up together and then you know dump it into a whatsapp group or whatever it is um dartfish express is another one um i think the dartfish express subscription is probably about 50 quid a year or something uh, i haven't checked that recently it was 50 quid a year the last time i checked um but operates as an app on your phone or on a tablet um you can take a video you can do it's probably better for technical analysis for trying to look at skill execution um coaches a um i wouldn't have used it a lot but I know a lot of people have similar to the dartfish express you can take videos on your phone or on your ipad and you can play them back you can scroll back and forth through it just to let somebody see it so the those cheaper ones they've limited functionality uh they allow a lot of basic tasks to be done they're not overly efficient so you certainly wouldn't go to canovia to, to code a whole match um you're better off at that stage if you're going to be getting into regularly coding whole, full matches you probably need to look at more specialist software um and that would step me up then to the, what i'll call them moderately priced um i'll bear with me on this because i know sometimes when i say moderately priced and throw the prices out people people are a bit surprised um I would use Dartfish, um, and, and I've stuck with Dartfish. There's been a lot of new stuff has come out, um, but Dartfish probably is around about seven or eight hundred pound for a year's license, um, and that's probably one of the probably one of the more reasonably priced ones. Um, there are packages. Some people will be aware of Performa Sports. Um, it's an iPad based one. Uh, a lot of clubs would use it, um, and yeah the, look it's it's out there it's, it's fairly widely well it's widely purchased whether or not it's widely used is probably a different a different question um there's options with knack sport um and i see i think ben mcguckin's in here ben would be a fairly big user of knack sport but at the moderately priced thing you can you, you can get knack sport scout plus which is quite a useful tool um not 100 percent sure of the price but i think it's probably in around four or five hundred pound for a year's license um so th those offer a wee bit more complex and more functional more complex functionality um and allow for a wee bit more efficiency if you're trying to tag a full game so you know, i was having a conversation with Owen before anyone come in there and i would typically code a full match um at a fairly basic level so your kick outs your turnovers your scores would be done in about two hours um to go into a wee bit more detail in terms of player detail you're looking maybe at about four hours so you know they, they offer a wee bit of a wee bit of efficiency for doing those processes um there are things that you just can't do and um, so adding you know with dartfish i can add a turnover and i could add four or five different things around that so was it a kick pass um who did it where on the pitch it was and um, was there pressure on on the ball you can add all that um there are things that you can't do with the likes of canovia so the cheaper things the cheaper um software or the free options you can't do that um the very high price stuff uh sports code elite max sport elite again i know look i know some at county level are using those but a lot of them have a high amount of background technical features um and they're really only relevant relevant if you've a person operating in a full-time position with that team um because otherwise you'll just never get to those features um and that that's probably the key thing to remember they're, they're not worth investing in if you're not going to have someone who's got the time to dedicate to it the one thing I would caution about any of those subscription models, which I think the majority of them are now, um, you need to be really careful with ongoing access because I know there have been several clubs that have been caught out, especially with performance sports. When they let their subscription go, all their all their video and all their data is disappearing with it. Um, I'm not entirely sure where that stands in relation to GDPR and whether or not Performa have the right to do that, but this is what they do um and it's largely for them to try and retain their subscriptions um so having a backup copy of your video is particularly important make sure you've got it saved somewhere else um so at least you can take your video and you can work with it elsewhere um but it's something that has come up quite a bit um and you just need to be need to be aware of it so in terms of how it can be used there's there's quite a bit that can be done academy level but there's probably a lot that isn't actually relevant so if we look at typically using um our video analysis in a club setting or in a county setting it'll be used on a match to match team analysis so we'll, we'll do every match we'll video or we'll video it and then we'll analyze it according to the team 
uh, you know, what's the team done? How many turnovers? How many kickouts have we won? How many scores have we got? Um, you can then extend that out over the course of a season. You know, so you can extend that out, right? With 10 matches, how have we performed on kickouts? How have we performed on turnovers? And that's typically what happens at club and county level with teams that are, I suppose, with teams that are um, results based. Now, big question for the academy level is that relevant? Is that the best time spent? Um, because those improvements aren't necessarily an indicator of improvement of an, at an individual level. Improvement in those team performances might be a byproduct, but it's certainly not the best indicator of what an individual performance is. So at academy level, it's probably one of the areas where I think video analysis is probably more important to be looking at an individual level. Um, so trying to get individual clips or individual stats and returns in terms of what players are doing in games, potentially even in training, um, you know, depending on what the content of the training is. Um, so individual analysis for me at academy level is definitely the priority. Um, if you've got the time, if you've got the resources, um, the key things are what are you measuring and what are you measuring against. And again, I will cycle back around to that um, in a slide or two. The training session analysis, again, this is something it, it's so dependent on what you're doing um, and, and what you're trying to improve. And if we're thinking about it from an individual point of view, it might be really beneficial. There might be something you've asked one player that you need them to improve, and then you set out and say, right, in this training session, we are doing A, B, and C. So I'm going to keep an eye on how many times you execute. It might be someone you know, taking shots off their left foot. Right, so we're going to we're going to have a look through this this shooting exercise that we're going to do, and we're going to see how many efforts you have off your left foot, and then how many scores you get, and what your success rate is. So things like that, on a very basic level, that don't have to be formalized, it can just be done very very simply. Um, in terms of video and training sessions, not absolutely essential, not something that would have to be done. If you do it, it helps. You know, it's always something to refer back to. My experience of that is more often than not, it will never be used. The video of training will be taken and it will never actually be referred to again, which becomes wasted effort. Um, I suppose in terms of how it can be used, the crucial thing, and, and this this is something we'll maybe open up at some stage here with questions, or maybe towards the end, we'll, we'll get a bit of, bit of quick conversation going about it. The crucial thing is identifying the exact project. <clears throat> um, so what do you want to achieve from your video analysis? How are you going to deliver it? And what are the intended outcomes? So that's, in terms of the how, they're the things that I would absolutely highlight and say you need to have them nailed down before you actually embark on any video analysis. In terms of how it can inform decisions, um, I'm gonna, I am actually going to invite a bit of debate on this because I, I, I do. Th these are things that I don't have the right answer for, um, and it'd be interesting to see what what the take from the group is. So, in terms of the questions that I would ask around this, um, is it right to base each of these? So, I'm going to throw up the first one as an example. So, player selection or inclusion within a squad. And the first question I would ask, is it right to base player selection on video analysis? Be it in the chat bar or sticking a hand up or even just unmuting yourself and offering an opinion. What are the thoughts in the group on that? Maybe a question, Kevin, is how many people use video analysis with academies? Even you go back as far as that. I'd be interested if, if you do, if you do use it, put your thumb up. If you don't, obviously don't put your thumb up, but that'll be a reflection on how many people are actually using video analysis within the pathway. Jack Wharton uh, has his hand up there. Jack, do you come in and unmute yourself and ask your question there? Can you hear me there, Owen? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, just on the point you have there, Kevin, player selection and squad inclusion, maybe it can help prevent bias with particular players in the squad. I don't, for whatever reason you might have, whether you're involved with their club too or you know them better than other players, at least there's the information and the stats there to back it up for their inclusion or not in, in certain situations. Maybe it's more towards competitive games and minor squads and stuff, maybe not just with younger age groups, but definitely it can help prevent against that or even the, the notion of it being said that it is bias. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that that point's absolutely on the mark in terms of what video can do. I suppose everybody's aware of 
various things that fly around at academy level in terms of accusations of oh they're you know they're more prone to pick people from certain areas or certain clubs or or whatever it may be um and whether it's true or not is you know it's largely we're only able to prove that <laughs> no one no one's able to say that is the case or isn't the case um the new can play a big part in that even just having the video and being able to look back um and look back through performances it's a big big part of it um so just is there is there anyone else has any thoughts on that in terms of how it can operate or how it can help i didn't i don't know if anyone answered eugene's question about how how many people actually use it kevin i think it's it's a great prop in a sense maybe to confirm things that you have in mind like i'd like to think you know you have a good memory for things that happen during a game but it's fantastic to be able to go back you go back through your video and check those things and really confirm you know that what you thought did actually happen or maybe didn't happen or even that you know to some extent maybe that the stats people are actually picking up the things that you want them to pick up um so i i just think it's got a lot of uses but you definitely wouldn't be solely based in selection or on that there'd yeah. be a number of things yeah, yeah, can i come in there yep go I, ahead just just to reinforce you've said it anyway but it probably allows coaches to not only identify weaknesses but also show players where you know their issues are because it's easy saying to somebody you're not doing something right or you're that you're missing what you're doing here but when you actually show them they take that that information on board so from that perspective it's a it's a massive you know tool so it is yeah so that's you know i think that, that that's probably one of the key things at academy level it's actually been able to show people um it's shown rather than just telling um I'm sure a lot of you know as coaches, you can tell and tell and tell, and some players will just never actually get to the point of understanding it. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. To me, it's a vital part of it, and I completely understand. I'm with, I suppose, Jimmy Rogers. It's it's not the be all and end all. It's not what all decisions are based on. But I would argue you make far more informed and far better decisions by having it to refer to. Uh, and I think that's probably one thing that we've got to keep in mind when when we're trying to implement a video analysis system. It's there to help, um, and it shouldn't be there to hinder. If it's hindering things, we're not doing it right. We're getting part of it wrong. Um, okay, Paul here. Just can I just ask you a question? Now? Some yeah. pro, some professional sports have offered contracts or signed players or athletes on video analysis or even YouTube clips. Any thoughts on that? Or uh, madness. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I know a lot of them, and Paul, a lot of them are, are, are stories that will be pushed out in the media about how that's how they did it. There will be a lot more in the background, but it will be, it'll not just be video. So there'll be, at professional soccer level, there'll be all sorts of databases in the background in terms of performance stats and stuff like that. Um, and there, there's a big, big, you know, Liverpool were one of the first proponents of it, of looking for players that hit certain um hit certain criteria um look, to be honest one of the most recent ones is uh jada who's now playing for liverpool in the summer he was signed and it was a complete left field sign and nobody saw it coming um but whenever they actually looked at the numbers and the stats and his performance he, he was very very close to and very similar to um i think it was sadio Mane in terms of how he played and that was seen as being a natural progression in terms of the age profile and everything so there's an awful lot come into that so um it wasn't just based on the video analysis, it was based on a lot of the stats that was generated from that as well. So, you know, a big, big thing. I think in terms of player selection, come back around to that, I think it's definitely a tool to help. It's certainly not what you're going to base everything on. Uh, at the end of the day, a video of a match will not tell you a whole pile about the player's attitude um, to training or anything like that. Um, and there's all those other aspects that go to trying to select a, a player who is suited to the academy system and progression progressing to high level performance um so in terms of progressing from one squad to another and this is a slightly different way of looking at it can can video or can performance analysis help with that um my thinking on this and i'll throw this out there and again welcome to take responses if an under 15 player knows in the role that they play what it takes to play at under 16 level does that help them to get to that level Throw that question out there again, Kevin. So if an under-15 player, you have an under-15 player in your academy group, 
and they play a certain role, um, you know, whatever role you, you decide. Um, does that then give them something? If you turn around and tell them at under 16 level, this is what you need to be doing in this role, does that help that under 15 over the course of the year to develop the important things that they need to, to move on? Okay, thanks. So, you know, I, it's, it's just the use of the data, use of the video on how you can try and improve them. And it may be even showing the under 15, look, this is the, the guy at under 16. This is what he's doing. This is how he does it. You know, a wee step better than you do. This is the wee thing you need to add to your game and having those clips available to show people. Um, and having even a couple of numbers around, you know, this is how many times you need to do this in a game or whatever it is. <clears throat> Positional decisions. So what I would talk about there would be if you have a player who's maybe played, come into the academy setup, having played in midfield for his club, and you're straight away putting them in the midfield for an academy group, and under 14 is usually to do with size, it might not be the best position that they're suited to. They might have a might, might have a skill set. They might have, um, you know, an application for the game or a knowledge of the game or an ability to read the game that might suit better to play in, you know, at a number eleven or maybe even in at fourteen, um, or in two or three years when other people have caught up size wise, this player might be best suited to be playing, you know, a wing half back or a wing half forward role. So there are things there that you could be looking at in terms of key numbers that might actually point towards where that player could be suited to in terms of positions. Um, more so in the long run than at this particular point in time based on, on their physical size and their physical capacity. <clears throat> Is there any other areas, I suppose, in terms of how you think it can inform decisions? And I'm opening that up to the group, just to, if there's anything that I haven't touched on there, um, you know, again, drop it into the chat or, or raise your hand and, and fire away. I was going to back up. Gonna... Coming back from injury, Kevin. Players coming back from injury. Is that is it, is it used in that context? Is it used? Um, maybe their strength and conditioning. You know, to see what sort of can they ride tackles or burst through tackles or whatever. Would it be used in any of those contexts? If I do, I suppose more so from a um, a technical running point of view, it would be used. Um, so you'd use it if someone's coming back from an injury and you know an S and C or a physio wants to get a look at their maybe their striding or their, their running technique. Um, that's how I would have seen it used before in terms of actually getting into the games. Um, I haven't seen it used. I'm not saying it couldn't be. That's Has it been used in the gym, for example, to yeah. ex examine technique and yeah. give feedback to players? So definitely for players coming back from injury or athletes coming back from injury, it would be used in the gym from the point of view of just looking at the range of motion. Um, the, the, the big thing with a lot of those guys that do that is they have got reference points. So, you know, they've got a, a before the injury reference point. So they can then refer to that and say, right, well, look, you know, when you're squatting, you're still 10 to 20 degrees short of um, what you were pre, pre-injury. pre um, I think this is a potential pitfall of what we're doing at the moment if you just try to look at it now. Um, so say I get injured tomorrow, I'm recovering next week and someone puts a video on me and they then look at me and say your you know your squat depth is all wrong. If you don't have a reference point, if you don't have something to say this is what you're doing beforehand, then that, that makes it very difficult because to be truthful, I can't squat that deep anyway. Um and I maybe was never able to. Um so it has potential, but again it's it's a long term it's a long term project. It has to be built over the long term. Just thinking about that, uh, Kevin, on the terms of the technology and stuff you were talking about, um, in relation to the SNC stuff, um, there's a good app out there, it's a free app, Huddle Technique, which um, a lot of coaches will maybe use in terms of looking at uh, acceleration, maybe into top speed mechanics, uh, and been able to like show in the video live, just straight after they've done it, you know, like your you're maybe too upright in your acceleration phase, you know, and you can kind of relay that message back to them and it's live for them there and you can slow it down into different frame rates. So um, that could be a good one for coaches to maybe think about. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's an all one that falls into that sort of free or low price category, um, you know, and it can be used on a phone or, or an iPad. Um, similar to Coaches A, similar to Dartfish Express and offers that, that sort of immediate feedback. Um, 
good shout on that one. I haven't used huddle technique much. I would typically use Dartfish Express, but it's essentially the same sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> stick, stick that one up there, Owen. What is it, Fiddle Technique? Huddle, huddle Technique, H-U-D-L. So in terms of how video analysis can inform development, um, of three different things I'm going to throw up here, and it doesn't necessarily need to be limited to these three things, but in terms of individual player progress, um, do we know what we're measuring? And I'm, I'm not here on this call to tell people what is right and what is wrong to measure. Um, my question is more, do we at least know what we're measuring or do we at least know what we want to want to measure um, and whether or not they're the right things? Um, where is a player now? So having that baseline, having that, as a player comes in at under 14, this is what they're capable of. This is what they produce, relating back to those numbers, um, those things that we want to look at, and having the video, um, having the video available to them, to be able to say this is what you're currently doing, and then where do they need to get to? So can you show them, <clears throat> you know, this is in two, three years' time at 16 or 17. This is the sort of stuff we need you to be able to do, um, and having those lines in the sand, if you want to call it, those, those benchmarks. Um, be it in terms of producing numbers or in terms of producing, you know, a technique or technical execution of skills or the tactical now to be in certain positions at certain times, whatever it is, um, that's completely individual to every county. It's completely individual to every every coach within a county in terms of what you want to look at. And me and no other analyst is in a position to turn around and say these are the things you have to measure um, because what you measure and what you look at has to tie in with your own coaching philosophy and how you're trying to play a game. Um, you know, I've, I've seen, <laughs> at senior level, I've seen coaches who have a very standoff approach. They basically play a very defensive game where team the team will filter back into defensive zone very, very quickly. And then a coach is at the same time hammering a team because they're not turning the ball over in the attacking third. Um, so measuring things that are completely irrelevant to the way that you want to play the game um, and things like that, that that we just need to nail down. We need to really get through a process of thinking about our coaching philosophy, thinking about what our coaching philosophy looks like in terms of behaviours on the pitch and then which of those are measurable or what can we look at within that to say that we are executing that properly. So our coaching impact, um, and this is something that Again, talking at academy level, are we actually looking at the impact that we're having? So where did a player start and where did a player get to? That isn't all on the player. If we're the coach or we're as part of a coaching team over the course of a season, it's on us to say, well, they have made that progress or they haven't made that progress in this area. Um, and having a clear idea in our own head over the course of the year where you want them to get to, can really help to guide the coaching process on what you're doing. Um, so it's that idea of, I suppose, giving you a roadmap. Very, very quickly learn that this team need to do, or this player needs to do A, B and C. We'll have to build our sessions and build our training over the course of the year to make sure that we're getting that improvement. Um, and then measuring that at the end of the year um, to see how, look, it's basically has it been achieved. If it's been achieved, it may or may not be on the coach. It may or may not be on the player but at least knowing if it's been achieved um, and that measures or helps to measure the coaching impact. And this is one that I want to throw out there. Um, as academy coaches, I've referred to this already. Most people here are currently on a pathway, on their own coaching pathway. You're probably well established at this stage, but probably have further, further progress you want to make. Um, and I'm going to ask for a raise of hands or a thumbs up within the chat bar. How many within the group have carried out their own analysis of their own coaching behaviours? You mean a formal, a formal? One, or I mean, you're 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 constantly reflecting on your behaviours, but you mean something formal? I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean formalised coach analysis. 
So not just reflecting, but a, a, an actual analysis of your own coaching. Not too many. No. So we're all, I suppose everybody's in a position of trying to trying to talk about we want to improve players and we need to give them stuff, we need to give them stuff to measure, um, we need to measure them against things. In terms of, and, and Roger would talk about that, um, I would refer to that as well about, you know, reflection. As part of your reflection, how many people have actually gone in and said, you know what, and it, it can be as simple as positive language, negative language, just keeping a, a tally count. And at the end of a session, if you discover, you know what, 60% of what I said in that session was actually negative speak or negative language, then you're starting to think, right, there's something I need to change here. So th th there's a lot, there is quite a bit of stuff. And, and <laughs> I know Ben's on the call. Ben will uh, laugh when I talk about this. But we did it as part of a course one time where we actually looked at coaching analysis. At the time, we thought it was madness. Um, but as you start to do it, it becomes really, really 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 obvious the impact that it could have um so even things in terms of the instructions you give you know and are you encouraging exploration are you encouraging <laughs> see ben said we're never doing it again yeah that would be true um but um you know it's about providing good learning environments and are you giving those opportunities to the players and to do that and to see how your own coaching can help with that I think it's important for everyone, you know, to look at that idea of, you know, analyzing their own coaching. And that can be like, I know for the project that we did, it was video on one coach for one session. You know, so if you're going to video a session, have a video somewhere, somewhere on the session within your shot of you, so you can actually hear and see the actions that you're going through. Um, but it's something that as a reflective tool for coaches, it's something that at academy level, I think we should be doing. We should be looking at at least once over the course of a year. You know, with every coach, if we're serious about improving the players, we've got to be serious about improving as coaches as well. So something just to think about and it's just to plant that seed uh, of what your own traits are. Can you do anything to improve your own coaching and get messages across? I'm going to throw out now uh, a hypothetical case study. Um, and this, so we talked earlier on at the start about records and keeping records um, and the idea of what the potential that you have if, you, if we can start to keep some even very basic records, um, the potential it can have in later years. And this isn't, unfortunately, this isn't something that we can turn around now and say, brilliant, that will see, you know, we'll see impact from that in one year. Um, we're not at that stage, but we've got to start somewhere. So, in theory, we've taken player performance records every year in the academy. Simple as that. We've records of our star forward performances from under 14 right through to senior grade. The example I'm going to use here would be, say, Paddy McBrady, playing for Donegal, playing for Donegal seniors for a number of years now. We know he came through the academy system. Our new crop of under 14s of two players um, that both come in saying they want to be just like Paddy McBrady. That's the player they want to be. Brilliant, that's great. If we can give them figures or targets for what Paddy McBeardy did, say, eight years ago when he was in under 14s, how powerful could that be? Give them the progress right through. So every year they move through, this is what Paddy McBeardy was doing at under 15. This is what he was doing at under 16. So as an example on that one, if we could turn around on and say Paddy, in a 60-minute game, he would have had roughly 23 possessions. He would have taken 11 shots and he would have scored one goal, five points. There's something absolutely invaluable. If he was doing that on average in a game, that's not anything particularly difficult to count. That doesn't even really need video. Right, that's basically just someone keeping records of what's happening in a game. Yes, we might want to move to you know turnover counts. So yeah, he, had, he, he won one turnover and he lost two turnovers in a game. Um, maybe he won one kick out in a game. That probably needs a bit more level, and that's probably where a video could be useful because we can go back through a video and, and gather that sort of stuff up. Um, to be able to say to new players coming in, you know, what they need to be capable of at each stage um, and going right through their academy pathway. 
without having to refer to a senior player. Because there's absolutely no point in turning around to an under-14 now and saying they need to do what Paddy McBrady does at senior level. Um, it's it's so important that you're given you're given that layer of context of this is what this player did when they were at your age. Um, the you know and th- this this relates to a project I have operating within the institute where they're trying to do just that. They're actually they're the start point of this of trying to look at their academy players. Now, granted, they're only starting from under 17 right up to senior level, but they want to be able to say and want to be able to start to build that that pool of information that someone coming in in five years from now will be able to pick anyone on the pathway. If they play the same sort of position or the same role, they'll be able to turn around, pick, pick anyone right up to senior level and see what they did when they were at the same age. So, I, you know, to me, within senior or within a, an academy squad, we've got a great opportunity to do something like that. We've got a really, really good, I suppose, good format to be able to pull, you know, this is, this is year by year what you need to do. Um, it doesn't have to be massive detail, even even that keeping a track of the scores or keeping the track of, you know, the kickouts and turnovers, the basics. If you have those numbers and you can keep them, you know, recorded and, and well recorded and well managed, I think that's where you're going to to really get the power out of this. I think that's a good point, Kevin. Just on that, because I suppose under fourteen, under fifteen players in academy squads, they'll all try and aspire to be who the person is at senior level, like an under-14 goalkeeper will want to be Stephen Cluxon, but he's probably not proficient and physically developed enough and have the, the special awareness um, and the, as well as the, the other teammates uh, involved to be able to play and get to those sort of stats and levels. So I think it's a good idea to bring people down to that same level that they should be playing at and keep it very, very similar. Yeah. I think that that's exactly the point. Um, the problem, the problem being that the players, you know, you're going to have to start this with your, your current crop of players. So the lads at under 14, 15, 16 at the moment, they're not household names. Um, so you, you need to give this four or five, six years until these guys actually develop to that level. Um, and then when they get to that stage, that's where, you know, five, six years down the line, you've got the real power of this. Because you can say this lad has just broken into the senior county squad. This is what he was doing five years ago. Um, so to me, to me, it's great potential, great power, um, and something that you you know we should be starting to think about within academy setups. The practical challenges. Uh, <laughs> where do we start? Um, time, simple as. Um, the more detail we want to put to something, the more time is required. Um, I'm going to explode the myth for all the analysts everywhere. Software doesn't do it for us. No matter how much you spend on the software, it doesn't do the work for you. This, the work still needs to be done by an analyst or you know someone operating it. Um, so I would be very much conscious of the time, and this is why I think it's so vital to identify this is the project, this is what we want to achieve from it, and this is how we're going to do it. If you've got that, that's what you go with, um, and that should allow you to at least budget your time. Um, <clears throat> staff and coaching resources. To be honest, even even basic level video analysis, to me, it needs a dedicated person in any setup. Um, I, I have not seen it working effectively when someone is trying to double it up with coaching duties, because what will typically happen is we get to we get to a point where the pressure comes on and it's the analysis that gets sidelined because the person that's doing it ends up having to take more of the coaching than they were planned or or, you know, the, the groups decided to be broken up into five or six groups and they need all coaches on the ground and the person doing the video analysis just doesn't have the time to do it. Um, to me, it's a dedicated person. Their role within the setup is analysis. Um, and that's to operate as part of the coaching team. It's not to operate se- uh, separately. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many people are aware. I'm going to drop this into the chat afterwards. Um, there is a list of accredited analysts on the GA website. So it's been a project that's been running for a number of years now, um, where performance analysts go through various different competency training and um, and courses, and they have to go through a process of, of actually get, becoming accredited. Um, there is a list, a fairly lengthy list at this stage of accredited analysts, and the list online 
will tell you the level they operate at and the the county they operate within. So every county within Ulster has at least two to three accredited analysts at this stage. Um, and for anyone operating at academy level, that would be my first port of call would be to talk to some of those guys or, or reach out to them and see, yeah, have the conversation about what they think um, can be done or what they think is feasible. Um, but basically reaching out to the people that are accredited within the analysis area. Um, equipment and software, we've already talked about, you know, the, the software issues. Um, there are cost um, issues that have to be dealt with there. Um, first thing I will say about equipment, software, resources, find yourself a cameraman within the county. Um, get a cameraman who's, you know, fairly used to doing, doing sport. Ideally, GA, because um, to be honest, there is a there is a wee bit of specialism within getting it right. Uh, there's nothing worse than trying to operate off a bad video. Um, find a cameraman or get a camera um, and get someone to start working with, it so that you've got good and reliable supply of video. Because without video, everything falls down. Um, so that'll be the first one. Um, invest in an analyst or talk to an analyst first. Uh, before you decide on any software, look, I, I I've seen it far too often. Um, you've you've some very experienced coaches with little to no experience in basically little to no experience in, in analysis or analysis from the point of view of software, and they go off and they they talk about investing in a software. Um, to be honest, it's to me it's like trying to build your own house without having a builder. Um, it it's just there, there's a lot of expertise out there. It doesn't take much to lift the phone or drop an email to a couple of people who you know have experience in this area to talk about the softwares. But I, I've quite a few, quite a lot of experience at clubs asking me for help on stuff, and they've already invested in software, and it becomes very difficult then, um, because an analyst themselves will probably have access to software or a couple of different softwares, um, and. The problem with a new software is someone has to get familiar with it within a club um, and the time spent to do that will just fall by the wayside. They'll just not have the time to get to get fully up to speed with. Um, so, yeah, the software thing, I would just encourage talking to people who have been using the software before you go invest in it. A lot of them are substantial investments. You know, the, um, a couple of them are up around a thousand or fifteen hundred pound a year um, and to invest in that you know is it it's surely worth a phone call with a couple of experienced people to see what they think on it um your budgets are clearly a big thing um if you're lucky enough to get people who can do it voluntary for you then brilliant um the chances are at this stage for cameramen and stuff like that you're still going to have to have some sort of a budget available um but i suppose on that it would be Knowing your budget, knowing what, what your limits are, and then operating from there. Um, don't go storming off, buying, buying the software, <laughs> doing everything that you need to do, and then discover that you don't actually have a budget to follow it through. Um, so knowing that at the start is probably the, the big thing. The expertise, I've probably, I've probably hammered this enough at this stage, but again, referring to that list, um, and I see Owen's dropped the, dropped the link in there. Thanks for that, Owen. Um, but that link, Look, it's useful. It's useful because it might even throw up a couple of names that you didn't know of people that you didn't even know were um, operating within your county doing this sort of stuff. So um, have a look at it and see see what is there. Changing coaching personnel. So, you know, every year, it's probably more prominent at club level, but every year, even at academy level, there'll be people come in and out from a coaching perspective. Um, and what happens when a new manager comes in, it's usually an overhaul and a change of everything, and let's start from scratch. Um, and Owen will tell you from an S and C perspective, it's not ideal. From a performance analysis perspective, it's not ideal either. Um, you know, I think it's so important that projects are identified with support, understanding of the the long term decision makers within a county. So if you're doing a project, it has to be with you know support of be it county board or whoever it is that's making those decisions that it becomes a long term project that they are going to embed it. Um, and to be honest, this includes even changes to performance analysts because analysts will come and go. Um, as an analyst has done two or three years, if they've been you know good enough to do it two or three years voluntary, they'll probably then eventually decide that the time commitment just is, is too much and it'll move on and someone else will step in. So 
an analysis system that that is that leaves a legacy that can be picked up by somebody else and continued on um, is vital. Um, and the last one, the changing game. So on on pulled up a brilliant example there of Stephen Cluxon. Um, you know, it, it can be very easy to turn around to a young lad under 14 now and tell them what they need to do to be Stephen Cluxon. Um, but eight years from now, when they're, they're playing at senior level, the game might be completely different. Instead of playing short kickouts, we might be back to a long kickout game where you need that lad who's who's brilliant at playing a 20 or 30 yard kick pass, but he, he's he's not able to clear the halfway line with a kicker. But maybe that's the way the game's gone again by that stage. So, um, you know, th there's things there within the game that we need to be aware of that they will change. Um, and to, to pigeonhole a player to do a certain thing that eight years from now might be completely gone by the wayside, um, might not be a feature of the game. So it's about developing a sort of rounded player who is able to deal with that change as well. Um, and that's part of you know, it's part of the territory. I think the, the big thing about this, there are the basics in the game that never change. You know, um, and those basics. If you're developing those basics and keeping a record of how a player is developing with those basics, then I think we're we're definitely on the right path with that. Has anyone any questions around the practical challenges just before we move on to the, the, just this last wee bit? Happy enough. Okay, so time well spent or a luxury, um, and yeah. Um, as an analyst, I'm going to say it's time well spent. Um, but I, I do look. I don't believe those questions are mutually exclusive. I appreciate it's a luxury. It's a luxury from the point of view of time. It's a luxury from the point of view of resources, and it is a luxury from the point of view of probably the expertise needed to do it at a, at a really high level. Um, but if it's done properly and it's done at that high level, I think it's time hugely well spent. Um, if you can start to see the potential, the potential outcome of it. Um, and I know Paul Paul talked about um, players being signed um, based on performance analysis and I don't know if anybody saw this story it was probably a couple of weeks ago um, and De Bruyne signed his new he signed a new two-year contract with City the player himself actually utilised performance analysts and data analysts before he signed that contract and to be honest he used it to squeeze for more out of that contract um, the the premise of the story was that he he got a team of analysts to look at the basically looked at how Man City were set up in terms of their squad, um, the age profiles, their performance levels, and was able to identify that in the next two years City are likely to maintain their dominance. Um, but what these analysts were also able to establish was that he he himself, De Bruyne himself, was probably crucial to them maintaining that dominance. If he stepped away, the chances were City were going to slip back to not not necessarily being unsuccessful, but maybe not quite as dominant. Um, based, it's all based entirely on projections, um, but it's based on a lot of hard data that's already available. I appreciate that's at a completely different level from where we're operating, but to me, look, performance analysis, um, in particular data, is the next frontier in terms of what we're doing in high performance sport. The trickle down will happen. Um, so 20 years ago, S and C coaches were a luxury that were sitting maybe if we're lucky with an intercounty team. Um, and now they're in every club and every academy. Um, we've got an S and C coach everywhere. Same thing starting to happen with performance performance analysts. Um, you know, every county has a team probably of two to three at least performance analysts and clubs are now starting to operate with somebody who is their their analyst or their stats guy or whatever whatever they want to call it um to me the key difference between analysts and s and c coaches and s and c coaches you know their primary function is physical performance um and physical preparation of a player performance analysts are far more closely linked to the on-pitch coaching in terms of technical and tactical development um and it is something that's common um, and it's just, I suppose, where it sits within the, the academy pathway and that idea of is it a luxury or is it time well spent? Um, so it's it's certainly something that's going to, it is going to come, it is going to happen. And I think being prepared for it or being clear in our own minds what we need to do with it is probably the, the most crucial thing. On that note, 
Thanks for listening. I'm going to stop the presentation and take that off the screen so that I'm at least on screen and I will open it up to questions. Just before we jump into any questions here, I'm just going to, uh, I'll be foolish enough of me uh, not to I see we've got Ben McGuckin on the call here and Ben's a very uh, accredited performance analyst with Derry like, and he's been about the mill uh, and uh, Look, Ben, I would invite you just to come on and look, maybe even have a discussion here just in regards to you know positive things that we can do in terms of academy uh, analysis, some negative things maybe we just wouldn't need to be focusing on as much, um, and anything from maybe your own experience that you could relay back to, to the others. Thanks, Owen. Um, uh, probably even in terms of the academy, like even under 14s or under 15s there, that if we're collecting stats on a match or, or game information that it maybe doesn't even have to be delivered out to the players, but it's just kept the management team that they're knowing match by match or game by game that there's maybe areas that need improved. So maybe it's kickouts or turnovers or that, that it doesn't have to be a stack to beat players with, but at least we know that on match, and even the club level of this extent, that like if we don't know how what went wrong in the game, we'll not know how to fix it in the training field. So we can collect that sort of information on it. Um, the big change I've seen probably in the last number of years, uh, especially from development squads at the senior level, is that when players get it at that young age, they know that this performance analysis, it's not a negative thing. It's actually a constructive thing. And that um, as the years go on, it's about kind of, it's about improvement. It's not about, oh, you've done this wrong, let's see it. You know, so that's the big thing. And then whenever players now get at the senior level, they've had two or three years experience of it and it's just part of the system. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. Just on that, Owen, maybe just I think that's a brilliant point because I, I think it's more or as much at least to inform our training programme as it is, you know, to be firing at players all the time. And I think that's a great point that Ben makes because otherwise we don't know. We need to know what we need to address. Uh, and, I, and I'll just back, back up that too, too Roger. Like, the important thing, and I've, we've all been through this year with video analysis, is that whatever we're looking at in the video analysis session should lead on to the pitch. So, like, we shouldn't spend 20 minutes looking at kickouts and then the training session, there's never a kickout in the whole session. So, whatever the, the, the theme of the analysis session, it should be something that, that leads on to the training session. That may be something that happened previously in a match or, or a training. Yeah, brilliant. Can I ask the question, uh, Ben, uh, our Kevin as well, who worked with some of the uh, other sports, how do they integrate it into the training session? As, do you sit them down before they go out? Or do you do it on the pit side, or um, is there a, tech, a best a best technique you can use? Pro probably changes, uh, Eugene. All whatever suits in terms of time scale. Like um, if there's a match, just say on one weekend, they might spend the Tuesday night looking back at that match, and the Thursday night could be done looking at the next opposition. If you've got maybe four weeks notice, you might spend a bit more time working on your own sort of performances. Uh, again, at different sports, like. Um, some I've seen some rugby teams. I think it was the Iron Rugby team had a big massive screen inside, uh, like a three G pitch, and they were doing their video analysis session on the big screen while they were training at the same time, and they were going between both. I've seen uh, Marseille soccer team had a wee van with a screen in the back of the van out right on the pitch. You know, so it just it just changes, and it's something that that we we as an analysts as well are going to have to adapt to coming back from COVID. Like the, the, the days I've been stuck in a small room doing video sessions will probably change for the next few months. And maybe a, a big TV out in the stand or out near the pitch that we all can talk and like it's based out, you know. So we have to be adaptable too. Or yeah. else if, if, if Derry want to buy a big van and put a big screen on it for me, I will park it up in bed, that's fair enough. Ben, ben you know rightly Derry turn up to every game, every game with a screen coming out of that van. <laughs> um, I, I suppose from a, a step looking away from GA. Um, a lot of the the elite teams maybe have that that wee bit of time, um, you know, where they're maybe together in a group in an, an hotel setting or whatever, and analysis will usually be done as part of their, you know, I know some of us will have talked about load management in terms of load and stuff like that, and, and they will use, very much use analysis as a training session. So instead of being out physically loading, they're actually just working, you know, in a group with the video on, on the feedback. And look, some of those sessions could be ending up to about an hour. Um, not, it's that's not to say we have to be doing one hour long analysis sessions, 
Um, in the situation Ben talked about, where we're doing the Tuesday, Thursday pre-training, we're looking at ten or fifteen minutes. Um, but those those elite sessions, the only the only time I've seen that in the GA is whenever you've got an away national league fixture. You know, you happen to be away the night before, um, and you you will then sit down maybe the, the day or the evening before a game, and you'll do you know a, a fifty minute or one hour session or whatever it is. Um, and and that's I suppose it's a good sign that that's where the GA would like to get to. It's just our opportunity to do that is limited in terms of the time. Um, as, as we come into uh, at an intercounty level. As we come into this this sort of new phase where we're going to be probably playing quite regularly, I can see analysis playing a big big part because we'll have a limited amount we can do physically in the in the sort of week in between. So the the video level and the analysis being done on the previous week or the upcoming opposition is probably going to become become more important. I think some of the challenges that you presented, Kevin, are, are real challenges for the coaches on on the call here in terms of time and access to resources and cameras and taking doing the analysis. Um, but Ben Ben makes a good point. It's a bit like strength and conditioning. If you remember, you know, when we started the Institute, the lads were coming in and they had a training age of zero with S and C. Now, if they're coming into the Institute, they'll have a training age of at least three years. Mm-hmm. And it's probably the same around uh, appreciating video analysis and what it brings to the table. So I think, you know, if we can drip feed it in at an early level, uh, uh, in, some, in some way, and they do develop a respect for it and the need for it, and that it is a development tool, that's been used to make them better players. By the time they get to 18 and 19, you know that they'll be using it themselves. I know, like so Roger and, and and Kevin and Mickey and those guys ha- do use it even in club in the club context as well. You know that they, they've done use, use a video back with their players. Um, you know, so obviously you know, people do see value in it. It's just getting the time or getting the structure set up. And I'm just wondering, you know, given. You know the courses that are running now at, and third level, uh, and further education. That surely to goodness, it's it's possible to identify people to come in and support academies um, as a as a training as a training tool for them. You know, so there definitely have to be people in the system there. That because um, I can remember way back when we started this carry on. Uh, Denise Martin was in the institute at the time. You know, when we recruited a couple of people in from each county. The only person I know that's still active. And I'm not sure if he is, is with Tyrone, uh, Peter Quinn Levin. Peter was involved in that and was stuck with Mickey the whole, the whole way through. Um, so there are people out there with the interest. They're not coaches, but who are maybe IT people as well that have a good interest in EA. And I think if we go looking for them, we can find them. And I think they would be more than more than happy to come in and help as a volunteer. Eugene, just on that, sorry, the, the one thing I would definitely encourage looking at that list for people. Um, because there is list. Yeah. List. There's, there's maybe 100, 150 people on that now from around the country. Um, now, there's probably maybe a maximum of three in any one county, but there's still people there that, you know, even in my own county, I'm sort of leading analysis with Down, and there's at least one name on it that I didn't even realise was doing analysis with Down. So yeah. um, it's useful just to look at it, even if those people are, are a, a conversation, because they might be able to point you to other people who are, Doing this sort of stuff in clubs or something like that, um, but uh, there is a fairly extensive network. Um, the, just the, the other thing, and back to your point and the, the point that Ben made about um, you know players becoming experienced at it, and this is why I keep saying video is everything. You know, there's stuff that we've done in the past where instead of us myself or Ben doing any analysis, you can literally just fire the video over. You know, put a video, make a video available to players, and put the onus on them. So. Um, let them watch the video, or even if you don't want them watching the whole lot, watch a half of a game and just tell them, you know, ask them, pick out pick out one thing that you thought you did really well, or one thing that you thought you need to improve on within that game, and starting to get that ownership. Because at senior level, I've now, what we have at senior level, and I'm sure Ben will be the same, we've got players who are now data hungry, they want this stuff, they're coming asking for this stuff, you know, 10 years ago, it was... It wasn't as prominent, whereas now you have players who expect and want it. So that's already happening at senior level. So I think now, as you get down through the academies, it's going to become more and more prominent that they will want this. So. Yeah. Just on that point, Kevin, just uh, I was going to make it is that you know you could spend a hundred thousand pounds on on performance analysis equipment, but if players are not prepared to be reflective, it doesn't matter. So I think that's key. You know, once you get, they have to become students of the game, literally, from a young age. A lot of that's to do with how we coach players and. You know how we question them around their, their 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 game, and we can create that sort of attitude among them. You know, I think that's crucial. 
just on that point too, I was just listening to a podcast from Ray Boyne there yesterday about his Dublin experience, and he was saying that the the last year he worked with Dublin, he was just a facilitator. The players were coming and asking him for the clips. He was giving the clips, and they were actually doing their own analysis, and they were actually analysing each other. So Johnny Cooper would maybe look at Fitzsimmons and analyse his game and give him strengths, weaknesses, you know, and like that's the level you'd want to be at where it's you're just nearly you're providing the stuff and, and they're doing the work. Whereas at the, the early ages, you're probably, you're more kind of, you're leading the thing and you're facilitating the whole thing. Whereas at nearly the players take ownership off it at that sort of high level. Yeah. So uh, just to come in there. So uh, just what Kevin said a minute ago about the video analysis, um, that's what we found the club. We invested more in GPS for load management, but we, we found just letting the players have a look at the video or taking clips of them and showing them it, they jumped on it because they were they were interested in seeing where things were going wrong. So, as as somebody said, there you don't need to be investing necessarily in big money. Maybe county level is different, but a club level, um, definitely videos. It, it's a massive tool, so this. Um, and players eventually buy in it as long as they understand why they're getting it and what we're looking at and what what they need to be looking at. Um, that that's a that's a, key, a massive key thing. But it's it, video stuff is a simple way of doing stuff. You don't need a big a massive amount of money, so you don't. And what we found with the GPS is we moved from player attack to stat sport. You're probably aware of this, Ben. No one is. And because the players were getting the data feed right through to their phone after training, they started taking an interest in all the metrics. And so they were interested week on week. Once I see that this happened. So they're already self learning. There's a self learning thing there. So I think those things are really, really key. I think this has gone full circle, Kevin, back into the culture session we did at the very start with the high performance workshops. Um, you know, you're talking there about creating a creating a culture there that um, players, as, as Ben said, become responsible for their own analysis. Um, and I suppose that's the challenge with us, and particularly with the younger players who may not be just as mature. You know, there, there's a bigger uh, piece of work there. Um, but it's been a very interesting session, I have to say. And, you know, the practical challenges are the ones I suppose we have to take away and tackle. But, you know, the coaches that are on the call here that are that are working in the player pathway, you know, it's, I think my challenge, I suppose, to them is, you know, let's have a go at it. You can't continue to do what we've been doing and getting the same results as today. You know, so if, if we want to create better players going into our senior county teams, which is really what the player pathway is about, or better players come back into our clubs if they come out of the pathway, then we need to be trying different things. And I know if it was me and I was getting a quality service at my club and I went to the, the county and got the same service, well then I would ask the question, why am I going to the county? And I always believe once you move into the county setups, the bar needs to be raised. Um, and certainly, you know, when Tony and Kevin and Roger were running the, the academies down at Jordanstown for the, the, the four or five that come out of each county, you know, our challenge always was to work hard. And in this particular area, I do remember a session. I think it was Johnny Bradley maybe hosted the session. Uh, and the players were inside in the, in the 4G pitch. And we did something simple like just hook kick. Uh, and the lads hook kicked and then they went and got their ball. And by the time they came back again, they were able to play back their, their, uh, the analysis of their, of their hook kick. So we were really trying the technology, I suppose, at the time. But I think the players really valued it. They were glued to the screen. There was a big screen up and they were glued to the screen. I also know that uh, under Paul Kelly, Warren Minor. Uh, what, what year was that? Somebody jump in there. Uh, they they invested in... 2009. 2009. They invested in the uh, interactive whiteboard as part of the whole video analysis package. Uh, and at half time in games, they were doing feedback uh, to players and groups of players. You know, so um, some of our counties have tackled it with the, not outside of the senior teams. Um, now it took a wee bit of money to do that, and uh, uh, that's fine. But you know, I, I would be encouraging our coaches to try and uh, look at this and, and take it seriously and, and try to integrate a bit of it in, so that if I'm a player on their academy, you know, I'm, I'm going away thinking, shit, I got something special there. You know, and I think that's really where we want to get to. But um, I've really enjoyed the session. I'm going to have to dip out here because of another call. But you're welcome to chat away there, Owen. I'm going to leave it in your hands. Yeah, no worries. Um, again, look, if there's any, any other questions anybody wants to ask, now's the time. Um, if not, I'm sure Kevin 
Maybe we want to leave his details. I think he's uh, left a comment in there. So if you want to contact him, you can do so.